Science at the University of Manchester. Uh, and the, he is in the Royal Academy of Engineering. He's the chair of the Emerging Technologies. So his research centers on the safety, ethics, reliability and verification of autonomous systems. So he's involved in a number of research projects, deploying and verifying robots and vehicles in hazardous environments, uh, specifically in the areas of nuclear, offshore and space. So he co-chairs the IEEE's technical committee on the verification of autonomous systems and sits on both the BSI Robotics and the IEEE Failsafe Design of Autonomous Systems Standards Committee. So thank you for joining us, Michael. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass over to your good self, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to show my technological prowess by trying to share my screen and see if it works. Um, thank you all for turning up to this uh, presentation. Let me see if I can manage this. Oh. I'll let you know when it comes through. Sometimes it takes a little bit of a, there's a bit of a delay. But I'll give you the nod. It says it started screen sharing. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Something happened. Um, yes. Yeah. You will let me know, Sam, if it suddenly starts going slow or. I will let or... you know. Yes. That's it. Full screen. And it's even better than before, actually. <laughs> even better than before. It's perfect. Okay. So over to you. Great. Thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thank you everybody for turning up to this uh, seminar. One of the upsides of this is that I was unlikely to get 277 people turning up to one of my talks. So it's great to have you all here. I hope you'll find some of it interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing on looking at ethical decision making within autonomous vehicles. Uh, as you'll see from the title here, I'm introducing a little bit of extra uh, content. So I'm going to talk a little bit about trustworthiness as well, and a little bit about not just autonomous vehicles, but autonomous systems in general. So a lot of what I'm going to say is relevant to lots of different autonomous systems. So let me see if this will move forward. Sam, can you see the next page? Me, it caught me muted then. I can indeed, yeah. Fantastic. I'm going to check with you every so often. Okay, so um, this is going to be the overview of the talk. Uh, I'm going to, obviously, five sections. The uh, first one is trying to spell out the problem. What's the issue here with autonomous systems? What are we trying to uh, look at? What's, what, what's the problem with ethical decision making? And then working towards a solution. So looking at software architectures for um, autonomous systems, particularly robots and vehicles, and then looking at uh, how you can use those architectures and how you can apply verification techniques to assess the decision making to make sure it's, uh, the system is making the decisions that you want. And then uh, a range of examples, I'll give you a, a very brief in introduction to several different examples just to show you what types of uh, systems we're looking at and what types of ethical issues we're looking at as well. And then I can't, but yeah, I can. And then at the end, in case some of you are actually not interested in ethical decision making within robotics or autonomous vehicles, but you're interested in the ethics of applying these systems more generally, I'll talk a little bit about some uh, ethical apl applications of technology standards um, at the end. So as Sam said, I'm going to try and take a, a little bit of a break, uh, maybe after the software, software architectures part and answer any questions at that point. Otherwise, I'll try and answer questions at the end. Okay. So let's uh, begin. Uh, so autonomous systems. So there's a nice simple definition, a one sentence definition of what autonomy is. The ability of a system to make its own decisions and to act on its own and to do both without human intervention. So we want systems, be they uh, space, aerospace or ro robots in the home, robots in healthcare, uh, uh, driverless cars, UAVs, any of those different systems all to make their own decisions in, to some extent. Uh, there may be some human interaction, but at some point they have to make autonomous decisions and decide what to do. And that seems nice and simple. And what's the problem here? Um, so you might say there isn't a problem, but why don't we have lots of these things in our homes already? Why don't we have robots in our home? Why don't we have lots of driverless cars, fully driverless cars where you can sit in the back seat, fall asleep, and the car will drive you where you want? Um, there are some problems, and I'm going to try and uh, spell out 
three different sets of problems and then look at the ways we're trying to solve these things. So remember, autonomous systems make their own decisions. So the first one is um, it's easy to make decisions uh, to get a system to make decisions if you know exactly what's going to happen with that system. If you're in a predictable and known environment and you can work out all the things that could go wrong, then you can essentially pre-code all the decisions that you might need to make. So if your robot or your vehicle is working in a very constrained environment, you can work out all the possible things it might need to decide upon and fix those things in advance and pre-code it with the optimal solutions. That's great. Also, if you're in a situation where you don't really care that much about the decisions, maybe it's your robot vacuum cleaner or something like that, you're not that, that worried about how it makes decisions, then you don't care. But the problem is, what about if you have to make critical decisions or the system has to make critical decisions where you don't know the environment fully, you're very uncertain about exactly what's going on, and you're very uncertain about all the problems that might occur. And I've got a video here to give you a, uh, I'm going to use the other version, a video here to show you uh, what I mean. Let me see if this works. Uh, yeah. So many of you will have seen this before, but imagine that you're on this road watching what's happening. I'm going to turn the volume down slightly. No, it is down. Okay, imagine all these vehicles are autonomous vehicles. They're driving on your roads. There are humans everywhere. There are people on bicycles, people with dogs, lots of different vehicles, some are independent, some in a convoy. Um, traffic lights could go wrong. Uh, there could be rain, there could be ice, there could be lots of different things going on here. Can we predict all the things that will go wrong in this situation? And can we predict all the decisions that these vehicles will have to make? Um, I suggest it's unlikely, but you never know. So there are lots of different, um, and even this is a relatively constrained environment because there's only uh, a certain number of vehicles, there's only a certain number of people. You could think of a much more complex environment where you have to decide what to do. I'll play this a little bit longer, then we'll stop. So there are increasingly environments where it's very hard to work out exactly what will happen. So let me go back to the presentation. Apologies for that. Uh... So um, can we make decisions in environments where we don't know exactly what could go wrong and exactly what the right answer is at that particular moment? Um, and this is going to cause us problems in the future. And if you think about uh, some of you who've been through regulatory approval, things like that, then often what you have to do is a, some sort of safety case where you spell out all the hazards that can potentially occur and then work out how you'll fix those things or mitigate those the, against those hazards. But if you don't know all the things that could possibly occur, it's quite hard to do that. Um, and this, this brings us back to the issue of decision making, how you make decisions. And if you think of how not only humans make decisions, but these autonomous systems are going to make decisions, there's a whole different range of ways of making decisions. And I'm going to give you a very simple diagram, which um, skips over a lot of important stuff, but let's look at it anyway. So one way of making decisions is having reaction or adaption. So just like we react to things in our everyday lives. Uh, you can have systems that react to uh, input from the environment. Maybe some adaptation occurs as well. So it's a continuous interaction with the environment to decide quickly what to do at a, a relatively low level. Or we could follow some rules or regulations. For example, if you're driving on those roads that we just saw, then you're probably following a highway code of some form or uh, rules of the road or whatever you like to call them. So the rules and regulations that you follow, they're not totally specific, but they give you a general idea of what you should be doing in certain situations. And then at the highest level, in this diagram at least, um, we have ethics and principles. Um, so these are general principles that you use when you really don't know exactly what you should be doing. So there's not necessarily rules, there's not necessarily immediate reactions you have to have, but there's some general principles like you want to avoid harm or you want to do the right thing. Um, so these are very general principles that you use for making decisions. So all the, these things are all different uh, examples of ways of making decisions. And actually, in the systems that we're looking at, we'll have all these different types of um, mechanisms. And what typically happens is when you have very little time, uh, then you 
go to the bottom here. So you want to react quickly when you have very, very little time. When you think it's a very important decision or it's very critical, then you want to go to the top and work on what's the thing that, for example, saves life to make sure that there's no accidents, those types of things. But also um, this sort of hierarchy, this description here, the components at the bottom, such as reaction and adaption, work well when you have a good understanding of the environment. You know what envelope of environmental interactions you're working within. Uh, it works slightly less well if you don't know the environments, but if you, you can apply rules or regulations if you have a, a general idea of the environment. But if you don't know exactly what environment you're in, then things like principles and ethics can give you a way to make decisions. So what tends to happen in that sort of hierarchy is you move from the um, bottom up to the top when you have more uncertainty in your environment. So there's lots of different ways of making decisions and this is going to come back to, to us later on. So that's one thing, you, making decisions when you don't know exactly what's going on. If you do know exactly what's going on, it's, it's fine. Uh, the other pr problem is, I said I mentioned trustworthiness. The other problem is if you really have autonomous systems that make their own decisions and are going to make critical decisions, then there'll be this issue of, do you trust this thing? Uh, how do you know it will be safe? Do you know what, it, what this thing is trying to do? What's, what's, the, what's its intention? What's it trying to do here? And that might seem a little vacuous, but actually a lot of people are worried about these systems because essentially they think it's got something like Terminator hidden behind it, that robots or vehicles that make their own decisions will do something unpleasant or they'll do something with bad intention. Um, so how can we get around those types of things? Um, one way to get around them is to remember that we actually built these systems and they're not black boxes or we'll see later that they don't have to be black boxes. So um, Terminator would be a lot of, lot less in, lots less scary film if this thing, you could look inside and work out exactly what was going on uh, inside the decision making of that robot. Was it really trying to hurt people or was it just trying to move around and just people got in the way of accident? So if you want to look at decision making again and want to uh, increase trustworthiness, one way to do that is to expose not only what the system is actually doing, but why it chooses the, it makes the choices that it does. And this might seem really hard, but we built the system, we coded, for example, the, the software that makes decisions. So we can work out what the options are, what essentially what it's thinking, what choices it has, and why it chose one particular option over another. What was the reason it chose one particular option over another? So essentially the intention it had, what it was trying to do. So that example previously with Terminator, like I say, if that truthfully told everybody exactly what it was trying to do, you'd know for certain whether this thing was trying to harm you, or it was just a scary looking robot that was actually just very clumsy. Um, okay, so that's the second problem. Uh, the third problem is that we want evidence. We want to, uh, we want to know that these systems will really do what we, we expect them to do. We want some verification techniques, we want some techniques that will give some evidence that shows that the software components, particularly that control decision-making will do exactly what we expect. And, for us, this is a type of formal verification, so a mathematical proof to show that the system really will do what you want. Um, so if there are parts of the system that you rely on to make key decisions, then we need to, we particularly want to apply formal verification here, strong verification. Um, a corollary of that statement is that we don't want to rely on any component that hasn't been formally verified. So we, we don't want to build a system around uh, components that we don't really know what's going on. We don't really know what decisions they're going to make. We don't really know why they're going to make decisions. Um, so when we're moving towards these autonomous systems that really have to make their own decisions, we're relying on the decision-making software within these systems. We have to be sure, we have to be confident that these systems will do what we want. Um, and so we're gonna use formal verification to do that. So those three problems, uh, the problem of not knowing exactly what's going on and therefore having different types of uh, decision-making you have to appeal to, the problem of um, not knowing what intention or what reasons the system has for making the decisions it does, and the problem of having some evidence for showing that the system will always make the right decisions, the right types of decisions are all gonna come together at some point soon. So those are the issues we're trying to face. This all seems quite complex and difficult, um, but there are some things that are gonna help us um, with lots of autonomous systems, autonomous robots, autonomous vehicles, 
there are moves to help uh, there are moves towards architectural simplifications that are going to help us solve all or move towards a solution for these problems so first one is modularity it might seem obvious but uh, increasingly most vehicles most autonomous robots most autonomous systems are modular in some form so many of you will have seen the robot operat operating system which is the uh, standard way of building robotic components um, and plugging them together in a into robotic middleware and there are other standards as well so there's an iso standard a bsi iso standard uh, on modularity as well so having a modular system where you can separate out components uh, with different functionality is obviously going to be important for us later on. Um, so modularity is one thing that's going to help. Another thing that's going to help is transparency. And again, there are standards that have been developed to ensure that each of the components in your modular system is actually transparent. You can see what's actually going on in this thing. You can inspect the code if you need to. We're not going to have black boxes where we can't work out what this component's going to do. Um, so transparency is going to help a lot. Um, the third thing that's going to help is what I've called verifiability here. So that's not just being able to look at the code of a component, but having some idea of what it's really meant to do. So having a, a specification, and because I want to do formal verification, I'd like a formal specification, if possible, a specification of what each component is going to do. So in this um, picture here, it's a made-up architecture, obviously, but each of the components, uh, for example, for a planner in your system, has some sort of specification that says, this is what this component is trying to do. Given some input, it will produce some plans for us for a particular goal. Um, so each of the components will have a specification of what it's trying to do. And at that point, you have a chance to maybe analyze each of those components to see whether they really match their specification or not. And that's what we're going to do later on. So the step towards modularity, where you can separate out components, is going to help a lot. The step towards transparency is going to be good for working out what the components are doing and leads on to verifiability where we can precisely say what we expect each component to do and carry out some verification to check whether it really does that, uh, whether it really achieves that or not. Okay, so we're gonna have those, uh, uh, those aspects of software architectures are gonna help us when we build our autonomous systems. Um, the other thing that's gonna help us is the hybrid, architectures, you can't see it here, but each of the components in this architecture could be very different types of things. Uh, this planner could be a, a symbolic planner, a uh, sensor here could be some data fusion uh, node that brings together sensing data, uh, motor, this could be a control system, an adaptive control system for controlling motor, there could be lots of different aspects here. So each of these components could be very different types of things. Um, so we're going to have hybrid architectures. So they're not, not, it, not it, all the components aren't necessarily the same. And to give you an idea of how this works with the decision-making that we care about, if you think of those decision-making aspects that I mentioned earlier on, where you go from reaction and adaption through following rules and regulations onto uh, looking at principles and ethics, then we want to uh, have a hybrid architecture where there may be lots of components doing things like ad adaptive control and reactions, but we want as much as possible to be to put our decision making into symbolic components. So if you have a symbolic component, this is a component that is easier to verify. A description has a precise description and has an explicit description of exactly what it's what it's doing. Ideally, we'd like it in logic, but it doesn't always work like that. Some precise description of what the decision making is is doing at that point. And this covers things like rules and regulations and principles and ethics. If we can encode that into a symbolic component, then we can do a lot more in terms of verification, which I'll mention later on. Um, so the other thing that we want to do is we want to expose, as I mentioned before, expose the reasons this system has for making the decision, taking the decisions that it does. Why does it do certain things? And to do that, we actually use a particular form of symbolic component, um, those of you may have come across agents before, we, could, we have a rational agent here that encodes all this decision, decision making. So the rational agent, the key thing about that is, it, is it, it exposes the reasons it has for making choices. So typically it has things like explicit goals, beliefs, intentions, all those types of things. 
And you should be able to interrogate this agent and ask it, why did you do that? What was the reason you did that? What is your current intention? What are you trying to do? Um, so for any decision that you want to make, uh, you should be able to interrogate the agent and find out exactly what it's uh, doing and why it's doing it. So we're going to encode uh, particularly the rules and regulations and also the ethical uh, decision making in symbolic components. They could be in several components, but it's easier to think of it as in one component. And the rational agent aspect gives you this um, explicit intentions and beliefs. These things are first class objects and you can get the system to say exactly what it's trying to do and why it's trying to do it. Um, so if you think about, I'm going to go back, I shouldn't do this too much, but if you think about our favourite um, Terminator example, if the Terminator on its chest had a screen that exposed exactly what its intentions were, and you could ask it, why, why are you doing that? Then it would be clear whether it's uh, trying to do harm or whether it's just very clumsy. It wasn't trying to do harm. Okay, so we're going through, excuse me, going through modularity to separate out the components of our system, transparency to make sure we can understand what's in each of these components, verifiability to make sure we can understand the behavior of each of those components, what it's trying to do. Um, and we're gonna have hybrid architectures that cluster these components together into various different types. And the hybrid architectures look a bit like this. You have high level, a rational agent for high level decision makers. There could be several rational agents, but let's assume there's just one. And uh, that makes the sort of high level decisions uh, about reasoning, selecting goals, all those types of things. And there could be lots of um, feedback control systems, lower, lower level systems, uh, adaptive control systems that are doing low level continuous interaction. And they do things like um, manipulation, if it's a, a robot that has some manipulator, or path follow, following, obstacle avoidance, if it's a vehicle, etc. cetera. Um, so these types of systems are the types that we build. And the reason for doing this is we want to make sure that our system, our autonomous system, and it's a, our autonomous system here is this dotted line, can explain the high level decisions it made and the reasons it chose to do that. What is it trying to do and why did it choose to do that? And that's why we have that rational agent there with explicit beliefs, assumptions, and intentions. So the whole system will interact with the world in various ways, but the rational agent will make the high level decisions and will we be able to explain exactly why they did that. So I'm gonna give you one uh, simple example just to justify this. If you think of flying in a commercial airline, which we're not allowed to do at the moment, but imagine that you could go on holiday in a commercial airline. There is a human pilot, several human pilots there. There is an autopilot which can effectively fly the fly the plane for for the pilots. The autopilot, once once the pilot switches it on, can keep the aircraft level. It can fly a, um, avoiding you know fly in a certain direction, follow certain waypoints. Um, even in spite of bad weather, it can plan around obstacles if there are obstacles in in the air. For example, at periods of bad weather, um, the human pilot once they've switched on the autopilot essentially makes the high level decisions about where to go to, when to change the route, what to do in an emergency and, and when to switch off the autopilot. So the separation of the low level, lower level flying skills and the high level decision making is what we use. And we're gonna, if we're gonna have an autonomous system flying this aircraft, for example, we all have the rational agent making the decisions that the pilot used to make. So where to go, when to change route, what to do in an emergency, these things are made by that rational agent now. So in the previous example, excuse me, that one, the rational agent here is gonna make the high level decisions about uh, where to go, what to do in emergency, um, et cetera, when to switch on the autopilot. The autopilot is a feedback control system that's following those instructions and trying to keep level and avoiding whatever uh, dangers there are. Okay, so there's a separation between high level decision-making and lower level interaction with the outside world. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I said I would take a break at this point. Um, let me just, excuse me while I stop sharing. Fantastic so far. Is there any questions or yes, yes, there complaints? Are. Just, just a couple of points. Um, 
Fantastic. Um, your slides are great. I think the resolution's a little bit low. We can see it fine. Oh, okay. The best thing to do is rather than using the spotlight, just use your just have your cursor around it. It seems to be that when you use a spotlight, it it sort of messes up the resolution okay. change in the image. Uh, so okay. Yeah. I won't do that. Okay. <laughs> so okay, let me just uh, pick at random uh, a few questions that have come through. We've got about ten questions so far. Um, have um, have any machine learning systems been formally verified? Uh, that's a good question. Um, no, I would say. Um, so you can no. Let's say no. Um, you, you, it's it's quite hard, and you have to do some. It depends what sort of machine learning. If you're talking about the machine learning that uh, learns from a set of examples that you produce, then you have to characterize all, ex all those examples. If you're talking about machine learning that does reinforcement learning from the environment, which you might not know, then somehow you have to represent that environment. And all those things are very uncertain and very hard to represent. So you can do some. Um, probabilistic verification, but it's quite hard to come out with anything definitive about how good this thing is. So when we, as we'll see later, when we do verification, we, we're not machine learning people, but we tend to uh, use testing for those machine learning aspects um, rather than formal verification. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to just pick another one at random, but I've also got a bit of a vested interest in this as a roboticist myself. Okay. Um, so who can be held accountable when autonomous systems malfunction? <laughs> that's, that's, okay, so that's a question for a lawyer somewhere, which I'm not. Um, so I don't know is the answer, but not me. Um, but it, so, would, it just makes you think, you know, as engineers, we do have a code of ethical conduct to make something as safe as possible. So, you know, you could say that as engineers, we are actually responsible or would it be the company that we're working for or would it be the people who've commissioned it? It's, uh, it's a bit it's, of a... It's a legal question, which I don't have the answer to, but late, later in the talk, I'll mention a little bit about, uh, we have responsibility to build these systems so we understand what they will be doing. And if we don't, then to some extent we're responsible because we're throwing these things out without due care and attention, if mm. you like. And uh, I'll just pick another one, if that's okay. Um, so it was it was great to see that you're talking about ROS and the middleware, and I like the way that you can separate different um, parts of systems. Wonderful. Um, now the question actually is: um, Is there a language or approach to codify ethics, and how could it be evaluated in a quantifiable way? I will give you an example later on, but. Yeah. Yes, there is, but the problem isn't that there is one. The problem is there are 73 different ones. Um, so there are lots of formalizations of lots of different ethical principles. And if you ask your favorite philosopher, you'll come up with another one the next day. There are lots and lots of possibilities. So I'll mention a few later on, um, but the issue isn't uh, that we don't have any formalization for suitable ethical principles is that there's way too many and there's way too many different ethical principles. So somebody somewhere has got to decide what are the right things to follow. Uh, again, not me. Okay, wonderful. So I'll, I'll take out some more random questions a bit later. We do have them rolling in. We're currently at 16 questions. So do keep asking. And I'm also following the chat as you've probably noticed, which is uh, fantastic. And um, did you want, are you ready to carry on? I'll carry on and do some verification and some examples and then probably go to the end actually and then come back to questions, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, it's working well. Uh, good, it's let good. me go back to the full screen again. Don't use the uh, pointer, okay. Okay, in case you've forgotten, in the last uh, two minutes, we're looking at, um, systems like this thing at the bottom where we can separate out high level decision making into an agent and have lots of systems that do interaction with the outside world and we want to apply verification um, and there are lots judging by the questions that many of you have seen verification techniques before so perhaps i don't need to say much about this but the most common types of verification are formal verification which is the sort of thing we do we use some mathematical or logical techniques to prove uh, that whatever 
system or component you're looking at matches some requirements. Or testing, where you look at a subset of possible executions of that component or system and check each one to see if it matches your requirements. Um, possibly I don't need to do this, but I'll do the testing example first, just to show you a system has lots of different runs it can run through. We've got a branching tree here, so the system can run any down any of these branches. Testing typically chooses a subset of these. Let's see the ones in red here. And for each of those runs, checks whether the requirements are satisfied on each one. Uh, formal verification is just an, just is an exhaustive version of this, that you want to do a mathematical proof to show that all the runs satisfy this property. And so you capture all possible runs of the system in some way. So it's more exhaustive. Um, both of these techniques are useful, but both have problems. Uh, formal verification is very slow, uh, both slow to actually apply and um, slow to develop the system that you will apply it to um, and often requires quite a lot of abstraction and modeling of real world details so if you want to interact with lots of um, bits of physics it gets very complex to do formal verification of these things which again leads us back to the question about formal verification machine learning if you're interacting with the outside world for example you know physics of images uh, you know photons etc it's very difficult to work out what's going on um, testing is great. It's a lot. It's a lot more efficient and a lot easier to do. But if you're well, it works very well if you know exactly what environment you're working in. If you have a model of your environment, almost certainly you're going to be wrong when it's a real environment. And we don't quite know how wrong your model is. So if you're testing some component in some environment, uh, it's quite hard to work out things like coverage because you don't really know how wrong the model of the environment is. Have you missed any uh, issues or problems in that model of the environment? And again, it comes down to this issue of uncertainty uh, in modeling what's really out there in the system. So both these things have their positives and both can be used in different ways. And we're gonna use both of these things in our verification. Um, so what we typically do is, um, again, we have our picture here, our rational agent, which is some symbolic component that allows us to do some formal verification. We, we tend to do formal verification of the rational agent to prove that it will make the right decisions or the decisions it should make. Um, and we can do some mathematical proof in various different ways. For lots of the feedback control systems I mentioned before, then for things like adaptive control, there are lots of techniques that are used already, so not necessarily mathematical proof, but um, maybe simulation and testing, um, maybe simulation or testing. Um, and we also can monitor what these systems are doing. So we can monitor how well they're recognizing various things. If it's a visual system, we can monitor how well they're, uh, they're controlling the wheels, if it's a control system, all those types of things. So different, um, different verification techniques for different components of the system. So as I mentioned before, these are hybrid architectures. There are different types of components, but it also means that we use hybrid verification. We have different types of verification techniques for different parts of the system. Um, so the rational agent we do formal verification on, the feedback control systems of various forms, we do lots of different uh, verification on, um, often testing or simulation. So that's what we're gonna do. And the examples I'm gonna show you in a little while, give you some idea of the types of things that we can verify. Often it's verifying decisions made by the system and some of them will be ethical as we get to them later. Some of them are safety aspects. Um, I will possibly skip the next slide, but I might come back to it if we have time. So let me skip this, ignore that. So I'm gonna go through a few examples just to give you an idea of what, what we can do with these types of systems. So one good thing about separating out the high level decision-making into a symbolic component is you get things like explainability much more easily because you have this rational agent that makes the high level decisions as a representation of all the things it's going to do, all the actions it has, all its motivations, all its goals, all its uh, beliefs. It has a reasoning system in there. So it should be able to explain exactly why it did what it did and also explain what it's going to do. So for example, uh, you can record all the choices it had and all the reasons it had for taking one choice or another. And you can do things like this ethical black box idea where you have a essentially a flight, flight recorder um, for 
a robot or autonomous vehicle that captures all the decisions you made and all the reasons you had for not making various decisions. Um, some of the robots we have have a why did you do that button? Essentially, you press the button on the robot and the robot says, uh, essentially asks the robot, why did you just do what you did? And the robot exposes exactly what its goals are and what reasons it had for making those choices. And if you think about the Terminator example earlier, if that had a why did you do that button on the front of it, then the film will be a lot more, a lot less interesting, but you might be a lot less scared of this thing if it explained exactly why it was doing what it was doing. And perhaps more important than why did you do that is what will you do next and why? What are your plans at the moment? What are you trying to do? And this, these sort of aspects help you with things like trust, trustworthiness, um, because you can get an idea of what this robot vehicle system is trying to do and why it's trying to make the decisions it does. Um, one of the things that erodes trust quite quickly is having a system that makes decisions and you have no idea why it makes decisions and won't be able to explain to you what's going on. So explainability is, uh, is slightly easier if you have a symbolic component like a, an agent making high level decisions. Okay, let me just give you a safety example. Um, so this is just a a simple example you might want to verify for a domestic robot that's wandering around your home. And you might want to verify some statement like this. The robot will always try to wake the human when it believes there's a fire. And what we want to do is to prove that this is always true of the decision maker at the center of the robot. So our rational agent, when it makes decisions, should always satisfy this property. And we can prove that, which is great, but there's a couple of things to remember here. Um, first of all, it's try to wait the human because we can't guarantee they actually will wait the human because uh, it's a decision that it's going to make and then it's going to call some uh, feedback control system maybe that sets off a loud alarm or tries to shake the human awake or something like that. So there's no guarantee it will actually work. It's just a decision to try to do that. And also it does this when it believes there's a fire and it believes it because some sensor input has provided it with a enough convincing evidence that there is a fire there that it has to decide to do something. So at this level, we're just proving that the decision that this robot makes is the right decision. If it believes that there's a fire, then it will try and wait the human. So again, it's, sorry, I'm gonna go back again. Again, it's this picture of the rational agent that if these uh, low level control systems have provided enough evidence to say there really is a fire, then this agent has to make a decision and then call these control systems again to actually maybe make a loud noise or, or wake the human in some other way. Um, but we can verify the decision making to make sure it always makes the right decision in those situations. So let me go forward again, sorry about that. Uh, so those types of examples. Um, we can, the example I gave you earlier where the an autonomous, agent replaced a human pilot in the in the aircraft if you think about that then the human pilot is just following uh, the rules and regulations that human pilots should follow so human pilots should follow the rules of the air there are various different rules that tell you how to fly through airspace um, if that's the case and we now have a an autonomous vehicle an unmanned air system then surely the, the software that makes decisions should also follow the rules of the air. So for example, you could take the rules of the air, use those as requirements and do some formal verification of the agent that's actually flying uh, this unmanned aircraft. Um, and so those rules of the air are unfortunately written for humans. So they're quite hard to formalize sometimes, but you know things like when two aircraft are approaching head on, then each shall alter its course to the right. We'd like to verify that the decisions made by the um, agent controlling our unmanned aircraft actually matches that and does the right thing. Um, so we can do that type of verification as well. So um, verifying not just um, safety aspects, but verifying the rule following that I mentioned right at the start. Um, I possibly, maybe I'll give you this example just to, excuse me. I have a short video just to give you an example. I don't know. Okay, this is a a simulation of an let me stop it. A simulation of an unmanned aircraft. You can see it's unmanned because there's no windows in here, but it's high fidelity simulation with um, you know gusts of wind, different weather, etc. But there's an agent just like the one we've been 
talking about in the middle of that aircraft. But the agent isn't doing very much. All it's doing is the high level, carrying out the high level decisions. So it's decided uh, we're going to taxi to the edge of the runway. And it's called some control system that's going to do the navigation to the edge of the runway uh, quite slowly. Let me go a bit faster. And then it gets to uh, the point at the edge of the runway and then it does some communication with air traffic control. And then the agent decides to take off. Again, quite slowly, let me call some feedback control system again, which is going to do the takeoff, some autopilot, which will um, take off. Right. So at this point, the autopilot is flying the plane. Uh, all the agent is doing is deciding when to switch off the autopilot, when to uh, change course for some reason, what to do in emergency, all those different types of things. So again, it's just taking the high level decisions that the human pilot used to make. Uh, one decision it should take relates to, for example, that previous rule of the air we had, that if you see another aircraft coming towards you, you should turn to the right, if I remember it correctly. So if it detects another aircraft coming towards it, it's going to turn to the right. The other aircraft is yeah, in the distance over there. It's this proper simulated airspace. It'll turn to the right, following the rule of the air, and then it'll, once the other aircraft is passed, it'll turn back on, it'll turn back onto its route and engage the autopilot again to follow the route it had before. I won't do any more of this landing thing. Okay, so let me go back to the presentation. So, as I mentioned, we can take rules of the air. I've only mentioned one rule there, but you could have many more, quite a few more rules of the air. These are rules that your human pilot should follow. Uh, and then you can verify that your uh, rational agent that's controlling your unmanned air system, your UAV, um, will actually follow those rules as well prove that it'll always make the same decisions. It doesn't mean it won't, things won't go wrong, but it will always make the decisions that it should do. Um, well, you can do it for air systems. You can also do it for uh, automotive systems. So again, if you have a human driver or a car, as you know, you have to follow the rules of the road, the highway code. And again, you can take elements of the highway code, capture them in a formal way to say, you know, what you should do, for example, at road junctions or, or in overtaking mode or something like that in some formal specification. And you can take the agent that is at the heart of these autonomous vehicles um, and do some verification to check that the agent actually matches this um, formal requirement that we have based on the rules of the road. So it doesn't, it's not sufficient to say that this is enough to make sure that the you know, the driverless car will work properly, but it's necessary that at least the driverless car follows whatever rules of the road that everybody else is following as well. So if there's a, a regulation that human drivers should follow, then probably the driverless car should follow that as well. Okay, so again, we can do verification of the high level decision making that the system um, has. Okay, uh, oh, should I give you, yeah, I'll give you this quickly. Um, no, I will skip that one. If anybody wants to talk about road trains, I can come back to those, or vehicle platoons, I can come back to those things. Um, okay, the title of this talk was Ethical Decision Making, and there's lots of different ways of, of um, capturing ethical decision making. A very simple way of doing it is something like a trolley problem that you'll have seen before. So this is a version of a trolley problem, but with UAVs. So imagine you're on a manned aircraft, uh, which we for example, had in the last um, example. Maybe we verified it against the rules of the air and it follows all the regulations that it should. Um, but something's happened. You know, the engine's on fire, it's about to crash, it's going to fall to the ground. Um, we're in a situation where we have to make some decision. There are maybe no rules about these things, so we have to make some ethical decision. We have to decide uh, if we're going to crash, is there anything we can do? And if there is something we can do, can we avoid uh, harming anybody? who's on the ground. So there may be some possibility of this UAV as it's, as it's falling to the ground, being able to do a little bit of maneuvering. And maybe it can work out that there are different sites it could land on, maybe on a school, on a field full of animals or on a road. And it's fairly obvious which one you would try and land on. But a typical way to do ethical examples or a simple way to do ethical examples is just have high level orderings, ethical priorities. So this sort of thing where you say that it's more important to save human life than it is to save animal life, which is more important than saving property. So if you 
if all else fails and all the rules have failed and you don't know what's going on, uh, but you can assess the situation and work out which uh, option is most likely to avoid losing human, human life, then you should do that. And if there are options that avoid lose, losing animal life, you should do that too. Um, so in this case, ethics are just ethical orderings of these higher level properties. So this doesn't say very much apart from you want to avoid harming humans. So the system, if it's able to, has got to do a fairly quick assessment to work out which of the landing sites are more likely to harm humans. It may be one and three, maybe just one, let's say. Um, so you want to avoid hitting the school. Maybe the road's empty. So that'd be great if you could land on the road and you want to avoid um, hitting animals as well. So a simple ethical example is just to have an ethical ordering such as this as a very high level guide to decision making when all else fails. You have no plans left. You have no rules that apply in this situation. Uh, you've got to decide what to do. And having a high level ethical priority uh, ordering like this will help you to some extent. And we can verify that, formally verify that our agent that's making these decisions, if it has that ordering, if it has that ordering inside, will always make decisions that whatever decision it makes, every other decision would be worse, or at least as bad. So it never misses out um, uh, with this order with respect to this ordering. Okay, so that's a simple version of um, ethical choices. We can get more complicated. So another another common way of doing um, ethical uh, analysis of robotic systems is to have your favorite robotic system that's uh, deciding what to do. But just before it decides what to do, it gives the options that it had uh, or its, its planned actions, the options it has to a separate component, an ethical governor that works out if those options are actually ethical or not. Are they going to cause danger? Do they match the ethical principles that you, you should be following? And if they are, if they don't, it might um, the ethical governor might veto some of those actions, or might say go back quickly, choose a different action. So these sort of ethical governors are uh, regularly, often used for ethical decision making because they don't necessarily change the robotic system that much. The robotic system or the autonomous uh, system just has to give the options and the choices to the ethical governor, and the ethical governor says whether this is a good or a bad um, choice potentially reorders the choices and gives them back to the robotic system, which carries them out. Um, and again, we can we can think of this ethical governor as encoding particular ethical properties that we care about. So it may be an ordering, it may be something much more complex than that, that captures all these different um, ethics we want. We might say, uh, if ever there's um, a robotic system has, what should we say? has an action that gets too close to humans, we want to veto that one. We don't want robots to go anywhere near people. And that's our ethical principle. So whenever there's a set of actions, any that look like they're going to put the robot near people, we might veto those and not allow the robot to do that. And again, we can do formal verification of the ethical governor with respect to the properties we care about, just to make sure that um, this software, which is essentially an agent, is just capturing exactly what we want of our ethical principles. So ethical governors are popular too. Um, there was a question earlier on about, is it possible to formalize lots of different ethical um, theories? Uh, yes, it's possible to formalize, not by me, but there have been lots of attempts in uh, logic and philosophy to formalize lots of different um, ethical uh, theories. And there are many, 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 many of these different theories um, I'm not going to go through all of these things because I can't remember all the details of all these things. But for example, we we collaborated with people who have formalized all these different um, ethical theories. So utilitarianism, where you have essentially some um, utility, some quantity that you're trying to maximize, some principle, principles to do with Kant and principles of double effect. All these things you can formalize in various different ways, and all of them you can verify of your system. The particular thing we're interested in here was what happens if your system, your autonomous system, moves between uh, contexts, between situations where these ethical principles change. So maybe you're in one of these um, contexts where it's utilitarianism and you have, you have some goals and you have some uh, intentions, you have some actions, and you work under utilitarianism 
ethical principles. Um, but maybe then it moves the autonomous system, the autonomous robot moves to a different scenario, a different system where we have, um, let's say, principle of double effect instead. How does that affect what the system is going to do? Again, you can verify that you always follow those principles, but how will that affect the outcome of your system? It may be that your goals, your intentions, your plans all remain the same, but because you're moving to a different context, the outcome is different. And again, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but there are lots of formalizations and they're very complex and messy of these um, many, many different philosophical um, ethical principles. Okay. So there are more examples, but I'm not going to go through lots of those. Hopefully I've given you an idea, an idea of the different uh, ethical aspects. These three different types, whether it's a, an ordering, an ethical ordering, or an ethical governor that is able to um, stop various plans or actions that the robot is doing, or even fully formalizing um, philosophical ethics are popular ways that people are developing these um, the formalization and verification of ethics. I promised I'd also say a little bit about the other aspect of ethics, which is the ethical use of robotics. I want to say a little bit about um, the standard, which maybe some of you have seen. So the BSI, BSI standard BS8611 is Guide to the Ethical Design and Application of Robots and Robotic Systems. So it's not about the ethical decisions that are made inside a robot or an autonomous system. It's about the ethical design of these systems and the ethical application of these systems, what we should be doing when we design these systems and what we should be looking at when we try and apply them in various ways. Again, I'm not going to go through it all in detail, but it gives you a long list of lots of possible uh, ethical issues, ethical, ethical hazards that you might need to address if you're developing, a, a, let's say, a robot in the home or a robot in healthcare or a driverless car, any of these different types of things. And they're all the things you would expect, lots of different aspects. So societal aspects such as, such as trust, uh, anthropomorphization, which I can only just say, et cetera. Um, commercial aspects like employment issues. You know, are we really deploying these, should we really be deploying these robots and depriving somebody of jobs, for example? Dehumanization aspects, um, environmental aspects, all these things. Um, the standard doesn't tell you what you should do. It just gives you a list of things that you should consider and you should assess how your system, whether it's a vehicle or robots or even a piece of software, um, addresses these. What, it, what is it actually doing? Does it actually cause some deception? Does the person using this thing think this robot is really alive, for example? Is that... And is that good? Is that a good form of deception or a bad form of deception? But it gets people to think about exactly what's going on. So that's quite a useful, I think, standard, which I encourage you to look at if you're thinking about really applying uh, real autonomous robots. There are not many around. Um, and I'll skip that one. Uh, the last comment I'd like to make is the verification I've described already is only about the decision making in the system. We can only prove that the uh, agent that makes the high level decisions will make the right decisions. We can't prove that something bad won't happen. We can't prove that there won't be an accident. We can't prove that, uh, let's say our driverless car won't crash into something, okay? Because it's a physical environment. However, we can prove that the robot or the vehicle never intended that to happen. So again, going back to the Terminator example earlier, if we can prove that that Terminator robot never intends to hurt people, then even though the robot might have accidentally walked into somebody and knocked them over, it never meant to do that. And it wasn't part of its plans, it was just an accident. Um, so it might seem like a small aspect that we can't actually, you know, it might seem like a, a fault that we can't actually prove that nothing bad will ever happen, but we can't do that with the physical world anyway. We have no chance of actually proving that bad things won't happen. All we can do is to prove that the right decisions are made and that the robot or vehicle never intended a bad outcome. So that helps us at least step towards um, having some confidence in these systems. If we can prove that the system never intends to cause problems, never intends to hurt you, you're much likely to trust this system, much more likely to trust this system. Uh, okay, so just last uh, wrapping up, um, the key aspect of these autonomous systems is that they have to decide for themselves what to do. 
if it's not an autonomous system you're worried about, then that's not a problem. Somebody else has to decide. But as soon as you give responsibility to the system to make decisions, then we have to know how it's making those decisions. As I, as I said at the start, if we know exactly what decisions it could possibly make, we can enumerate all the right answers and everything's fine. But this ethical decision making comes in when we don't know what's going on, we don't know all the details of the environment, and we'll come across some situation we hadn't planned for and doesn't match our prescribed rules. What will we do at that point? And that's where we need to assess the way decisions are made. We can't assess each individual decision, but we can assess the way decisions are made and do some verification of the way that systems uh, make decisions. So what we're moving towards is not looking at each of the decisions that could be made, but looking at the way that our autonomous system, our autonomous robot makes decisions and not only worrying about what it will do, but exactly why it makes those decisions, because we can't specify everything it will possibly see, because we don't know, don't know what will happen. Um, okay, I think I will probably stop there and go back to questions. There are lots of things I didn't mention that you're probably less interested in. Um, Sam, do we have any questions at that point? Oh, we've got plenty of questions. <laughs> oh, <I God>. <laughs> <laughs> and some really interesting comments on the chat as well, links to um, uh, law websites.